Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to podcast number 126. In this particular podcast, we are going to interview paleontologist Walter Stein. This man is going to give you all the information you need about going out into the field and digging. If you've always wanted to do this, if, if you've always wanted to go out and actually dig up dinosaurs, now it's only eligible for people 10 years and above. So, um, you want to pay attention to his interview because we have all that information about it. It is really cool. Some of the stories, some of the things that they're finding is incredible. Now, when you go out and you dig, it's not a race. You don't get to run around and just pick up fossils. That's, that's not how it works. Um, you act, you have to work. He explains what to do. You, you'll walk away with more than just fossils. You'll walk away with an experience that would cost you a fortune to try to get on your own. Um, You do get to keep some stuff, which I found to be very impressive because a lot of times that doesn't happen. A lot of times it, it, they don't allow you to keep anything you find, but in his particular case, he does not a lot. Keep in mind, you're not going to go home with a, with a triceratops in your, in your pocket, but, uh, but it is really interesting. And he's also going to talk a lot about the Hell Creek formation, which is a late Cretaceous formation here in North America really exciting he gives some great insight into it so it's really really cool i'm also going to uh before we do that i'm going to answer a couple of asked dinosaur george questions uh just to get to those and then uh from there we'll move in and listen to the interview so let's start with dave matthews from missouri dave says just a similar name uh to the singer no relationship oh what a bummer Dave, I was so excited that I was going to be able to talk to, well, you would be the real Dave. I thought I was going to talk to that singer who's the imitation Dave. How do you like how I did that for you, Dave? I made you the original and him the imitation. You're probably younger than him, but it doesn't make any difference. All right. So Dave says, do you think that Lyplurodon could have been at least 50 or 60 feet is that a probable size in your opinion? You know, it's so difficult with like Pluridon questions because so few pieces of evidence have been found. And I, I don't know, Dave, whether or not they were ever, ever able to establish an estimated age with the bones that were found. Are we looking at an adult? Are we looking at an old adult? Are we looking at a sub adult? It's difficult to say, but here's my opinion of that animal growing much larger than that. Um, It would depend, obviously, on the food sources. And there were big sources of food back then. There was big sharks and there were, um, uh, you know, ichthyosaurs and and plesiosaurs, and all of which can grow to be pretty big size. So I don't know if I could think of anything that would prevent them from growing up to 50 or 60 feet. I don't know what the limitation would be uh, because the ocean obviously supports the weight. And because the ocean is supporting the weight, you don't have to worry about skeletal structure supporting it. So an elephant's bones would be more dense than the bones of a whale, even though a whale is two, three, four, five, six times the size of an elephant. But that's because gravity doesn't do its dirty work on you when you're in the water. So, Dave, I don't think there's any reason to think that they couldn't grow to that big, but I am unaware of any proof that would suggest that they do. All right, Susan from Tallahassee, Florida. What would happen if dromaeosaurids and truodontids were smarter than chimpanzees or us humans? Well, Susan, that would have changed, I believe. It, if you had a dinosaur with that level of intellect, it would have absolutely changed the balance of nature and there's no telling which direction life would have gone. Um, Now they never had the skull capacity to hold those gigantic brains, but it's not to say they couldn't have evolved them. Um, I just don't know 
If any dinosaurs could have gotten to be super intelligence, it would have been dromaeosaurs and truodontids because they certainly had an advantage over so many of the other dinosaurs they live with. But holy smokes, could you imagine a dromaeosaurid with the knowledge of a human, with the intellect of a human? That is a terrifying thought. Susan, I wish I could give you a better answer than that, but that's as good as I can give. All right, Walid from Pindi, Punjab, Pakistan. Asaluma. Wait. Ah, asala, asalamu. Asalamu alikum. Right? Asalamu alikum. That's his native language. Uh, asalamu alikum, Mr. Blessing. I was wondering if it's possible that cheeks of a Tyrannosaurus that give it its binocular vision could have been spaces for venom glands. Sincerely, Walib. He says, "Please pardon my English. Your English is perfect, Wali. And let me, Walid, and let me see if I do this. Wa, aliku, wa, alikuma, asalam. Is that right? Wa, alikum, asalam. <laughs> I hope I pronounced any of that correctly." Basically, what it is, is is a very courteous greeting that he used in his native language. And I butchered trying to reply with a with a respectful reply. So, Walid, if that just butchered it horribly, please tell your family and everyone in Pakistan that I am very sincerely sorry if I butchered that. But uh, wa alikum assalam. I think that's the proper response. Forgive me, but... Thank you, my friend. That's very kind of you. Okay, so uh, T-Rex has binocular vision because his skull is expanded dramatically by the eyes. And and what Walid is saying is because they're expanded so wide, could that have housed some, so, some sort of venom gland? Well, Walid, there's no indication at all that there was anything in there other than musculature and, and, and internal parts of the skull. But there doesn't seem to be a space for that. Now... I will say that a lot of the evidence that I've seen suggests that Tyrannosaurus has had a septic bite, not a venomous bite, but a septic bite. And what that means is a mouth that is so full of bacteria that a bite from this thing would be almost as bad as venom because it would attack the, the um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, your, wow, my mind just went completely blank. How crazy is that? Your immune system, that helps a bunch. Your immune, look, I can't even speak English, Walid, let alone your language. I can't even speak English today. So um, there's no evidence to support that they had venom glands, but there is evidence to support that they had bacteria on their teeth. Their teeth would have actually held and encouraged the growth of bacteria. So what it appears is that a bite from a Tyrannosaurus wouldn't just cause tremendous blood loss and injury, but it may very well have infected the wound and be able to follow you around until you dropped over dead. So uh, I don't believe there's any indication they had venom, but I do believe a bite from them would be worse than just the bite itself. All right, Dennis from Inglewood, New Jersey. Hey, DG, I was wondering, I've been hearing mixed reviews about velociraptors, real velociraptors, not the Hollywood velociraptors. Some believe they hunted in packs. Others aren't so sure. What's your take on the subject? Personally, he says, I believe it may have worked both ways. I don't believe they hunted in large packs like their larger cousins, but I do believe that they they may have paired for life like modern day counterparts with older generations coming back to help feed the chicks. I'm not saying I'm right by any means. It's just my own personal opinion. The greatest thing about science and paleontology for sure is that there is room for everybody to have an opinion and to propose a hypothesis. The, the best thing, though, is to propose it using as much science as available. And Dennis's opinion is based on modern animals that he sees around him today, which is absolutely fine for being able to form a hypothesis, make a guess. Now, to your point, you cannot say these things with certainty because I don't know of any velociraptor evidence where they found numerous species died together. We find that in Utah Raptor. We find it in uh, Deinonychus. So there's absolute proof that uh, Deinonychus and Utah Raptors are living in family groups. There's no reason to think that they would have that uh, behavior 
and other raptors wouldn't have it as well. So I suspect they hunted in packs. Whether or not it's true, I don't know. But there are benefits to hunting in packs. There are, are certain benefits to hunting in packs. But in, in a previous, um, when I recorded the other day, a podcast, something like this came up, and it was my opinion, and I still have that opinion, too many cooks spoil the stew is the old version for you younger people too many members of the gang and they can spot you too easily so i don't think they're living in those big big groups but i do think it's certainly plausible that they lived in family groups so dennis thank you so much for the question all right Stephen from lake butler orange county florida oh, what a beautiful state uh, uh, uh state you guys live in hey dg hope everything's going well for you thank you buddy it is I've been wondering if there were any quadrupedal theropods. Thanks for answering my question. And um, you're, really, you're a really great man for doing this. That's very kind of you, Stephen. Thank you so much. Um, quadrupedal theropods. I don't know. You know, when they when they reevaluated Spinosaurus, a lot of people proposed that they could have been quadrupedal. And if they were quadrupedal, well, then you probably have to look at uh, you probably have to look at Irritator at Suchomimus, at Baryonyx, all of those r relatives may have been quadrupedal. Now, it may not be quadrupedal in that, and for you young people that are listening, the quadrupedal means they walk on four legs. Um, bipedal mean they walk on two. And a lot of hadrosaurs are bipedal slash quadrupedal, meaning they can walk up upright on two or on four. So it may be possible that some of the theropods with the longer front arms, those I mentioned, may have been capable of doing that as well. I don't think, though, that would be the best form of locomotion for them. I think it would. It's like you and I. You and I falling down on all fours and crawling around looks kind of funny, but our rear end sticks too high in the air because our front arms aren't long enough. So we're walking with that downward like when you see a bear a bear kind of walks with this odd downward thing now they can get along fine on four legs but um but i don't think that would be the proper way to walk because i think it takes more energy walking this way which with your head pointing to the ground than it would in a more level walk and more av a normal gait i don't know of any uh tracks that suggests that they can do it. Any any recognized track sites? So I, I don't know, Stephen. It's certainly possible. I think it's possible. And uh, uh, if anybody could do it, I suspect it's going to be them. All right, let's take a short break, everybody. And then when we come back, I will uh, uh, I will play that interview uh, with uh, paleontologist Walter. It uh, it's going to be a blast. So hang around. Dinosaur Georgia's traveling exhibit to your school, museum, or city. This is the largest exhibit of its kind in North America and will turn any facility into a natural history museum. You'll see things like prehistoric mammals, giant fish, ancient reptiles, and of course, dinosaurs. It's affordable, amazing, and will be an event you'll never forget. See complete details at dinosaurgeorge.com or call us toll free, 888-487-7478. Bring Dinosaur Georgia's traveling museum to your community today. Boy, I'd sure love the opportunity to meet some of you guys uh, with my traveling museum. Maybe one of these days we'll come to where you are. Uh, the highlighted item for this episode is a raptor killing claw that was found in South Dakota. Now, it is not known for sure which species it is because so much, in fact, you're going to hear our guest in a minute, um, so much of it is, it's such limited, uh, there's such limited evidence and you'll hear walter stein speak about this in a moment in the interview but this claw was found by a friend of mine and it is wicked and it looks very very similar to a velociraptor so it may have been a northern velociraptor it's absolutely raptor but it is it is crazy cool the item number if you choose to order this on my website is item 5005 my catalog is store.dinosaurgeorge.com, or you can just go to dinosaurgeorge.com and you'll see a link. It retails for $7.95. It can be shipped worldwide. It is well worth it. It is a wicked looking little claw, very, very deeply curved. And I think it measures about three and a half inches on the outside curve. So it is definitely something that if you, uh, 
if you like uh, dinosaurs and you'd like to start a collection, it is a replica. It is not authentic because I don't sell authentic fossils through my site. Um, but it is a replica. So, all right, let's jump right into it. Paleontologist Walter Stein. This man has a company that he'll take you out and dig for dinosaurs. He's going to talk about that. He's also going to talk about what lived in the Hell Creek. So let's go into it. You know, to anyone who loves late Cretaceous dinosaurs, there is one formation in North America that has produced some of the most amazing fossils ever discovered. Well, I have with us an expert who can tell us everything about the Hell Creek and a whole lot more. This is paleontologist Walter Stein. Walter, welcome to the show. Hey, George, how's it going? Thank you uh, for inviting me on. This is, uh, is kind of cool. Hey, man, I, I know this is the middle of your busy season, so I really appreciate This is a Sunday for everybody, just so that you know how committed this man <laughs> is to, to science, and I appreciate it. Walter is nice enough to take time out of the only day off he's got during this busy time of the year, so I really appreciate it. So, Walter, can you can you start off first by by telling us a little bit about yourself, maybe uh, family or business or, or what you've been doing? Well, sure, sure. It's it's been a ridiculously busy summer uh, this year. We've been we've been out now since uh, early June and just been digging like mad. Um, uh, I guess uh, uh, personally, um, I, I grew up in uh, Southern New Jersey of all places, and uh, about 15 minutes from where uh, the first partial skeleton of a, of a dinosaur was found in North America, a Hadrosaurus foci. So. I was real close to that when I was a kid. Wow, that got, and, you, that got uh, you hooked. <laughs> that got you hooked. What was that? Did it, did that get you hooked? Oh yes, 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 yes. That was one of the things that got me hooked. Uh, my uh, my mom uh, also was big influence. She took me around to the museums. I spent a lot of time over the Academy of Natural Science in in Philly. Uh, my grandmother used to take me down the uh, to the shore and. And we go along the, the Jersey Shore looking for shark teeth and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so that's kind of how one of the one of the ways I got in, into paleontology, in, interested into it anyway. Um, then let's see, I, I went to. Uh, you know, I, I, I always felt uncomfortable in New Jersey. Right. <laughs> it makes any sense? Uh, it's very, very. You know, the area where I grew up was very much uh, rural farmland and suburbs and and. Uh, um, and as the seventies and eighties went on to start getting more and more claustrophobic, you open your window and there's 10 other people looking back at you. So I always kind of felt claustrophobic in New Jersey. And, uh, eventually I went to college down in North Carolina, a little place called Appalachian state, um, where I managed to get my geology degree. And, uh, and then let's see, uh, basically I, um, I, I didn't have the patience or, you know, patience for the politics of, of academia. I didn't have the money. Um, I was one of those, uh, one of those kids that kind of started to fall through the cracks, let's say, right. uh, the ones who really wanted to become paleontologists and then something started to derail. Well, um, you know, right after, after I graduated, uh, from college, uh, I sent off about 50 resumes to different universities and museums saying, Hey, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to join your museum. You know, I'll, I'll volunteer in the lab. I'll work in the lab. I'll, I'll volunteer for a field work. Um, do you have any paid positions? Uh, put me to work. <laughs> right. I ha- have shovel and rock hammer. We'll travel. Right? <laughs> um, and uh, I wound up getting about, oh, three responses. Out of the 50 resumes I sent off, I got three responses, and all of them said, go, go to graduate school. Uh, get your get your PhD, right? Um, and uh, at, at that point, I was a little disheartened, um, but fell back on my geology training. Um, you know, for all the kids out there who are looking to get into paleontology, of course, paleontology is a study of ancient life. It's kind of a mashup between the study of geology or the study of the earth and uh, biology, the study of life. And so, I fell back on my geologic training. Wound up doing um, mineral exploration for a couple years. Uh, worked on some diamond and gold projects. I worked uh, uh, on some environmental projects. And eventually, I, one of the clients I, I worked on the most was a, a diamond project in North America. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. We, it, was, it was kind of a cool project. We were going all across the United States uh, looking for diamond deposits. Wow. And, uh, 
so I got to see I got to see a lot of the a lot of the geology. I got to meet a lot of the uh, you know the local folks, and um, it, it was very very beneficial uh, to to what I do now. Right. Um, you know, a lot a lot of the same mapping skills and the geology skills and uh, just some of the basic logistical stuff for field work. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a field grunt. That's 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 who I am. I, 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 I'm much more comfortable in the field, uh, you know, out talking to the locals and getting out there and seeing the geology and, and, and finding some cool stuff. Right. So um, basically, uh, did so I did that mineral exploration for a couple of years. And then um, um, I, I ran across a, a small private museum that I hadn't heard of before. It was just opening up. It's called the Wyoming Dinosaur Center. Right. And... Uh, I was lucky enough to get my foot in the door there. They needed a, a geologist to do some stuff there. And I started doing tours for them, and um, I liked it. It was great. I enjoyed teaching and, and uh, you know, in, in a field-type classroom. Right. You know? so, so that's how I got my foot in the door. And then uh, eventually went on to uh, work with Trebold Paleontology. I was uh, Mike Trebold's uh, right-hand man for a number of years. Eventually... Uh, helped him build the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Resource Center. Um, and uh, 2005, we decided it was, it was time uh, time to stop making other r- people rich and famous. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, my my wife and I decided, it's, you know, it's time. So right. we, we started Paleo Adventures, and we, we had a dedicated mission to, to try and train as many young paleontologists as we could. You know, that's that's so incredibly um, excited that you that you focused on trying to help other people at least understand paleontology, because you're right. Not yeah. everybody is going to go to college. Not everybody is going to to, you know, become a doctor of paleontology. That's not a realistic. It, it's great right. if you can. But what you're doing is is pretty incredible. Yeah, I mean, I always tell I always tell the kids that you know the best route. I, I took the the wrong route. Right. <laughs> I got lucky to get into paleontology, and and really the only reason I have been able to carve out my own little niche is uh, I'm just too darn stubborn to give up. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, that's you got to be a little creative. You got to be a little determined and stubborn. Uh, you got to have that grit to survive. Uh, there, there's just not that many jobs in paleontology. You're talking maybe 2,000, 3,000 professional vertebrate paleontologists, something right. like that. Right. Um, the budgets are getting cut. Uh, so if, if you, know, you want to get into the field, the most important advice that I can give is, is to be patient and determined and work hard. And if you keep doing that, uh, eventually you're going to figure out a way to get in. Right. You know, and, and it's funny you mentioned that I, I kind of had the same similar thing with you. I did not go to college to get a degree in paleontology, but this is what I love. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of created my own way to get into it. But you're right. It's amazing how many brick walls you come across uh, if you don't have that degree. But nothing can stop you if this is something you want to do. You can figure out a way to do it. You're a perfect exactly. example of it. And, and now you mentioned yeah, exactly. being busy. You're working on a couple of really big projects right now, right? What, what kind of stuff are you involved in now? Yeah, well, aside from the tours, then it's, it's uh, you know, that, that, that's basically, if you work independent like I do, uh, not connected to a museum or university, you have to have some way to pay the bills. Right. Other, otherwise, you know, they ch- shut the electric uh, off and they come and repro truck, <laughs> you know, so you got to have some way to finance your, your, your efforts. Um, and so the tours, you know, thankfully we've had a lot of really wonderful tour guests over the last, uh, 10, 10 12 years. Uh, I think we've had some 2000, some people come through our program, which is awesome. Wow. And, uh, we thank them every time they come through. Um, but yeah, now, so, the, so the tours, enable me once the tours are over to go back and do my own research. And I've got a a whole bunch of projects that I'm working on. They're all in various states of completion. Um, One of our main quarries that we're working right now is this just amazing 
uh, river channel lag deposit. Uh, it's called the tooth draw quarry. And uh, it's, a, it's actually a very complex uh, channel lag. It's alternating sandstones and conglomerate. And uh, the main horizon that's producing a lot of the bones uh, it looks looks almost as if it was uh, it looks like it almost moved like a debris flow. Wow. Just an incredibly uh, fast flowing current. Um, you you get these these tumbled up, ch- chunked, broken up, tumbled up uh, Edmontosaurus and Triceratops bones that clearly traveled a long distance. Uh, some of them have acid etching. Some of them have uh, uh, insect borings, um, and they're all jumbled up in this giant log jam with boulders of mudstone and claystone, and you've got um, uh, carbonized logs. And so it was really, really a cool deposit. And so you've got all these broken up bits and pieces, and then under it, you might find this beautiful, perfectly preserved raptor claw. Wow. Or you might find a a baby triceratops jaw. Uh, And, of course, as the name implies, tooth draw quarry, we get lots and lots of theropod teeth. Right. Uh, It's one of the... One of the best places, I think, uh, to find uh, tyrannosaur teeth and, and small theropods. So, so some of the projects that that main dig site uh, that we're on uh, has produced a lot of data over the years. And so, I'm just busy trying to put it all together, um, kind of an analysis of the quarry. That's one of our main projects. Uh, I'm also redoing some of the stratigraphy and the geology of the surrounding area. Uh, it's, called, it's called Deer's Ears Buttes, where we base um, in uh, uh, in South Dakota, Western South Dakota. And uh, that stratigraphy project is going to be interesting because we have uh, a KT boundary se- section, which is very complete. It's on one of the furthest southeastern lobes of the Hell Creek. Um, and uh, the interesting, really interesting thing is it may be a marine transition which is fairly rare. So I'm excited about that one. Wow. Um, let's see. Because we have all these uh, theropod teeth, uh, we're also trying to figure out uh, the whole biodiversity of uh, small theropods in Lake Cretaceous. Uh, so, you know, we have oh, over over 200-some small theropod teeth, Good which is grief. one of the largest uh, private collections of, of, uh, of raptors and troodontids. And, and so, and, and all these teeth, it's like every one of them is extraordinarily special. Uh, every time somebody finds a, a, a little raptor tooth on the dig site, we do a little, we got to do a little victory dance. <laughs> 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 oh, there's another one. That's, that's what we want. All right, get and then, I, then I walk over to the 10 year old who just found it and say, Oh, that's a very fantastic find. You get your name in our record book. It's so awesome. And Oh, by the way, I have to steal that from you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> yep. God. So, yeah. We've got one of the large, largest private collections of that, um, uh, that I know of, I think, uh, uh, based on my census, this other project I'm working on is a census of, uh, Hell Creek specimens. Uh, and we're somewhere, uh, you know, Berkeley has more than us, uh, and Yale has more, more theropod teeth. And, uh, there's a, there's a couple others, but we're up there. So wow. I'm, I'm really, uh, enjoying going through all the little tiny teeth and taking all the measurements and trying to find the different, uh, trying to figure out the different morphologies to separate them out and, and determine whether it's a species or genus level morphological change or whether it's simply related to tooth position. So right. that's a fun project. God. Um, yeah. Now that the census one is, is, is really fun. This is where I'm going to get in trouble, George. <laughs> <laughs> this sense, I, every once in a while, I like to get into trouble. <laughs> I, I seem to I seem to attract trouble for some reason, but, <laughs> But anyway, the, the, the census project is really cool because I'm, I'm calling up all the curators and talking with them uh, and, uh, of all the, spe- all the museums and places that might have Hell Creek material. Uh, so I'll call up a certain museum and say, can you send me, wh- how much Hell Creek material do you have? What have you got? 
How many skeletons? How many skulls? What genus? What species? Are they complete or are they not complete? Uh, we're reviewing um, online databases, trying to figure out, you know, are, are the databases up to date? Right. Are they behind the schedule? Uh, uh, is it accurate? Uh, is it an re- accurate representation of what they have? Um, and then <laughs> with that, um, and we're, while we're finding, we're finding that a lot of museums just don't have a good database, and that's, that's part, of the, part of the reason I'm, I'm going to get in trouble with it. Right, uh, because many many of these museums, that as, as much as they struggle, they don't have the money or the manpower to keep up with the specimens that they already have. Um, so, so anyway, but it's neat because from this research, I, I've been able to figure out that there are about 300 known Triceratops specimens, um, about 300 skulls and partial skeletons, and uh, unlike. Other researchers, I'm looking at just not just the the public institutions, but I'm also looking into some of the privately held specimens. So we have a huge database now, and it's growing and growing. And uh, yeah, that's, that's that's a fun project. Wow! And and you do all that in, your, some, in your spare time? <laughs> well, well, as I said, they're in various states of completion. <laughs> right. Uh, you know. Wow. In between, of course, you know, spending time with my family and, and uh, I got two young boys who are constantly keeping me busy. Wow. Uh, yeah. What a, what a life. Well, you know, it is the dream of everyone I meet. The dream is to go out and actually dig for bones. And it just turns out that Walter Stein has the ultimate opportunity for people to go. His website is paleoadventures.com. P A L E O A D V E N T U R E S dot com. Paleoadventures.com. Walter, tell us tell us about Paleo Adventures and what you guys do. This is fascinating. All right. Well well Paleo Adventures is uh, is basically the company that I wish was around when I was a kid. Um most of our clientele are, are families with one or two kids that are considering a career in paleontology. And, um, and, uh, we, uh, we, we basically, uh, train kids. We, we, we tell, we show them what dinosaur bones look like and what they should expect to see in the field. Um, we, uh, we get them out in the field. We show them tools. We show them the proper techniques for excavation uh, we take them right to known quarries like the Tooth Draw Quarry or Tooth Draw West. Um, we're working on another potential quarry in a different ranch. This one is the, the well site, which is a very interesting place. Um, but anyway, um, once we get them in the quarry and we've trained them, and if it looks like the kids are, are doing well, uh, then we turn them loose. And uh, we look over their shoulder and we tell them what they're doing right and tell them what they're doing wrong. Um, if they find something that looks a little above their skill level at that point, I might tap them on the shoulder and say, Hey, you know what? I, I have to take care of this one. Um, if they find a big chunk of a triceratops vertebrae and it's nice and solid, I'll say, okay, you're going to excavate this and here's how it's going to be done. I'll point here. You dig there. We'll both brush. We'll, we'll, I'll help you with the glue. And we'll of course get this thing uh, out of the ground and, and into a proper home. So, <sighs> So yeah, it's fun. It's, what a, I like to say it's uh, yeah. What an opportunity for for everybody that's listening or, or watching the video. This is the place to go. This is the place. You know, um, one of the things that I really like that differentiates what you guys are doing with some of the other places that that will take you out. You're actually educating. This isn't a run out, rip things out of the ground, and and you know a treasure hunt you're actually giving them an experience that for some it would take 10 years just to get the opportunity to do what you're doing for them. This is a remarkable thing. Yeah. You know, ours, our, our digs are, uh, you know, ours are the real deal. This isn't brushing sand off of plastic or planted bones. Uh, we're not uh, just walking around ripping stuff out of the ground with no documentation. 
Uh, we try and keep track of all the stratigraphy and the geology, and we note anything weird that we're seeing out there. You know, as a field guy, uh, it's very important to collect the contextual data. Uh, and so um, I make sure that I, I train the kids uh, in doing that. Um, but, of course, uh, of course, everybody wants to bring home something, but, uh, and we try and provide that as well. Uh, we split our fossils into three basic categories, uh, what we call common stuff, then commercial-grade stuff, and then scientific-grade stuff. Uh, and so guests can keep some of the common things that they find. Um, these, are, these are bits and pieces that you see throughout the Hell Creek. Um, you see them every, every outcrop you see in the Hell Creek. You have the potential to find things like garfish scales and crocodile teeth and triceratops teeth. They're very, very common out there. Um, chunks of dinosaur bone that have tumbled and whatnot. Uh, you know, those, those kinds of pieces, in my opinion, are, are far more valuable in a kid's hand or in a teacher's hand. You know, they're going to, you know, they're, teachers are going to take it back to their school. They're going to show it off to their kids. Uh, the kids are going to show it off to their families and their friends. Uh, they're going to hope, and hopefully through all that, they're going to create a few more scientists. Uh, and get them in, interested in, in the natural natural sciences. So it's, it's far more important in their hands than in a museum basement collecting dust, right? in my opinion. And, and there are dramatic differences between what is a common fossil and what is a scientifically important fossil. So obviously, oh, people, that, pe- people that come out can't expect to go home with the Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton <laughs> as as the prize <laughs> but no the, no the opportunity no. just to get to dig up something scientifically important and and you know the chances are who knows what new discovery could be unearthed by one of your guests who you know will then have an association with that discovery forever <laughs> oh absolutely absolutely you know we've had kids find uh, uh a carol raptor hand claws and foot claws we've had um, I had a, had a boy out, um, let's see, uh, well, I'm trying to think of a good example. We had, oh, a few years ago, we had a, a young boy that came out and found uh, a little section of a, of a rib. You know, as, as I'm looking it over, it looks to be a little theropod rib, um, probably a gastralia, belly rib. And I'm looking over the surface, and we're brushing it off, and brushing all the sand off and continuing to excavate it. And one, it wasn't huge. It was only about six centimeters or so. Uh, and across the surface, we see a whole bunch of bite marks. Uh, and it looks like another therapod was chewing on it. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing. And, of course, the, the, the boy's name goes in the logbook, and and, right. uh, and that's that's all recorded uh, as the co-discoverer. So, wow. Kind of cool. And, you know, if you're uh, a... a another, Oh, go ahead, please. Oh, no, that's okay. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, if you're a teacher or an educator, now this this season, you're, you're all but booked up, right? Maybe you have a few more slots available. But if... I have, yeah. Yeah, just a couple. Right. If, if you're a teacher or an educator, this also would be an amazing opportunity for you to get out into the field and maybe bring home some things to be able to show your students. Because what a motivator... You know, for for people that may think they never they'll never get to do this, you've got to go to paleoadventures dot com. You have all the information on there. It, it's just an incredibly exciting thing, and I would encourage everybody. And if you're looking for a thing to do next summer, everybody, now's the time to get get in touch <laughs> get in touch with Walter and get your name in that book before it books up too quick as well. Well, well, technically now is not the time because well, yeah. <laughs> I'm still yeah. in the field. Right, I'm still in the field. Right, yeah. What, uh, what a, usually, I end up setting the uh, the schedule around December, ah. uh, and then I start taking reservations right before Christmas. So that's nice. the time to call me. Ooh, good point. Okay, right around Christmas time. Nice. A lot of people buy them buy buy the trips as uh, Christmas gifts, and uh, right. But yeah, if, if they call me now, they're likely likely to get an answering machine because I'll be hanging off a cliff somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting. Hey, but what a great Christmas gift idea. Uh, you want to drive your, your parents nuts? Because now there are age, there is an age limit. It's it's 10 years old, right? Is that is that correct? Yeah, it's it's 10 and up. Right. Uh, it's, these are all day digs. You know, it, it, 
we start at eight o'clock in the morning. We don't usually get back till about seven thirty, eight o'clock at night. Wow. And it's the real deal. It's, it's, it's hard work. And I found that, uh, you know, most of the younglings don't quite have the patience level yet. Sure. Um, you know, 10 and up do pretty good, but, right. but paleontology is hard work. Uh, you know, last week we were in the quarry, it was 113 degrees. Wow. Uh, we had a 30 mile an hour wind gusting back and forth. We couldn't put the canopies up. So we were baking in the sun and 113 degree temperatures getting pummeled by sand all day. I think I found a raptor tooth in my ear. <laughs> but, but if you had, I was actually, oh, if, yeah, if, if you had to choose between that and wearing a suit and tie and working in an office, which would you rather be <laughs> doing? <laughs> definitely, definitely out in the 113 degree temperatures. <laughs> uh, that, that would be much better. I, if you want to, yeah, I wouldn't do well in a cubicle. <laughs> Don't put me in a cubicle. I, somebody, I'd be climbing a bell tower by the end of the week, probably. Not, you know, so well, you you've got some <laughs> you've got some magnificent images on your website for everybody. Again, it's Paleo Adventures, PaleoAdventures dot com. You've got some great information. You have all the information. You've got, uh, in fact, if you guys want to do something amazing, uh, just go in there and look at at um, uh, about you. I mean your uh, your personal history of what you've done and your credentials. It's pretty fantastic. So now let's get into the Hell Creek uh, because that's where you sure. did. So. Let's the Hell Creek, you know, you hear the Hell Creek a lot of times and some for some folks, they have no idea what that means. Can you explain first what why you give names to certain formations? And then can you tell us a little bit about what the Hell Creek was like when these animals were alive? Well, sure. You know, all these crazy geologists, you know, we like to name our rocks and it, it's it's easy for us to communicate uh, different aspects about those different rocks, different types of rock and different sections of rock. So basically a rock formation is a, a section of rock, can be anything from 20 feet thick to 2,000 or so feet thick, um, and it represents a certain environment, basically, or a certain set of environments that set it apart from the underlying and the overlying formation. So uh, the Hell Creek itself is basically an ancient floodplain. Uh, it existed from about somewhere around 67 to 65 million years ago. And uh, it's, it's not just the Hell Creek formation. It's, it's also the Lance formation and, um, you know, it's just a different geologist named it. Uh, the Hell Creek is actually named after Hell Creek, Montana. Uh, and the Lance is named after Hell Creek. Uh, Wyoming just happened to be two different geologists uh, naming and describing the rocks back in the uh, back in the day. So uh, so anyway, the Hell Creek uh, would have been uh, if any of your viewers or listeners are are from the southeastern United States, uh, it would have looked very similar to coastal Georgia, coastal Carolinas. You would have had uh, this broad uh, lowland floodplain with lowland forests. Uh, cut down into the, with uh, river channels and streams and creeks and estuaries and marshes and swamps. So, and of course, our dinosaurs are, are living quite happy and comfortably uh, in that nice subtropical environment. Wow. What, what a difference now when you walk out there. Boy, what a... What a... <laughs> compared to... <laughs> Yeah, compared to your 100-plus degree temperatures. so Yeah, compared to South Dakota, yeah. Right. <laughs> so in that lowland floodplain, because that's, that's a comment we hear a lot, um, I actually had somebody ask me once, well, if it's always flooding, why do animals live there? But that's not, that, that's not what a floodplain necessarily means, right? It's not wet and swampy all the time, right? No, no, no. Rivers migrate quite a bit. Um, you know, you look, picture the Mississippi River. You know, this this is a very large basin that it's draining. 
Um, the, the Mississippi River Valley is, is quite wide. Uh, the main channel migrates back and forth across it uh, as additional sedimentation comes in. Sometimes parts of it might uh, become overloaded by sed- sediment, and then a new channel or a new shoot channel will, will, will change direction. Um, you know, there's, a, there's, there's this, there's this never ending dance between erosion and deposition, right? In any given area, there's going to be a, a, this conflict between erosion and deposition. Erosion is where sediment is being removed uh, and deposition is where sediment is being laid down. And so in, in a floodplain, you're getting uh, a bit of both at various parts of, of the area. Uh, and keep in mind, it's not just one river. Uh, southeastern United States, uh, there's, there's quite a few river, larger rivers and smaller rivers that are draining into the Atlantic. Um, as far as the Gulf of Mexico is concerned, and, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, Mississippi River, uh, that's, of course, flowing out to the, the Gulf and uh, depositing lots of sand out in deltas right out there. So, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of what the environment would have been like. So now let's talk about the inhabitants. I'd, I'd, I'd like to first talk about the, the herbivores or if we have some omnivores. Can you kind of give us an overview of who are some of our herbivore and maybe omnivorous folks living in that plain, in that area? Uh, the herbivores? Well, yeah. you've, got, um, you've got a number of different herbivores. Uh, you, the, the big one, of course, would be Triceratops. Uh, Triceratops is by far the most common dinosaur that you find in the Lance and the Hell Creek. Um, probably more so in the Lance, uh, the Hell Creek, you start to see a few more Edmontosaurus. Uh, but anyway, you have Triceratops being the big, uh, the big herbivore. And of course, as the name implies, Triceratops, the name means three horned face. Uh, it's a, one of the best named dinosaurs. Right. <laughs> it's well described. Right. Two horns over the eyes, one over its nose, a big beak like a parrot for, for cropping off tough plants. Uh, quadruped, I mean, most everybody knows what a triceratops looks like. Right. Um, would have lived in big herds, uh, just like, a, like a, a buffalo or so. And, and uh, you know, just like those buffalo down there in Yellowstone Park, Yellowstone National Park, you wouldn't want to mess with it. Um, and, uh, it, it never fails to to amaze me that every year somebody in Yellowstone Park goes up to one of those buffalo and says, hey, why don't you stand next to this cute little cow and I'll take a picture of you. Isn't it incredible? No, it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. Yeah. Those, those uh, buffalo are big animals. They right. will throw you 30 feet into a tree. And, and they, they, <laughs> they're not interested that you're a human. <laughs> they, they look at no, you as, as a predator. And, and so if you get too close, they'll kill you. You know, talking about triceratops, I exactly. wonder, you, you had mentioned something about finding maybe a juvenile jaw. Now, there was a lot of debate going yeah. on about whether triceratops was not its own species. May, what was it? Chasmosaurus, I think, that they, they was proposed because the comment oh. had been they'd never found juvenile triceratops. Is, is that accurate? Well, I'm not familiar with that story. Uh, I do know the, the whole Taurosaurus. That's what it was. Yeah, that, that's it. Right. Taurosaurus. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Taurosaurus. Yeah, there's there's some folks out there in a, in a particular camp, we'll say, that um, that have been arguing that Taurosaurus is another it's another large ceratopsian. It's it's quite a bit more rare than Triceratops. Um, I think we if I recall correctly from the census, we had probably twenty or so wow. decent skulls or, or partial skeletons of it. So by comparison, it's much rarer than Triceratops. Um, but, um, I think, uh, based on the numbers that, um, I, I, I have my doubts that it represents an adult version of Triceratops. Right. Um, yeah, but, but there are some, there are some decent, smaller baby Triceratops material. They've got a the museum of the Rockies has an incredible collection of Triceratops skeletons and skulls. They've got everything from juveniles on up to adults oh wow uh so yeah so they, they have an amazing collection of uh of triceratops right. I, I disagree with some of their conclusions um uh, i think the taurosaurus 
is significantly different and certainly different enough to call it a separate genus. Right. But, yeah. Well, not, I've, you know, it, go, it all goes, it all goes back to that, uh, you know, that infamous uh, debate between lumpers and splitters. You know right. what I'm talking about, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think on both sides that they sometimes go overboard with everything. Um, I, I looked at a, at a couple of different triceratops skulls once and, Honestly, the only variation I could see was a little bit of horn configuration. But you see that in modern cows. You can have registered cows who are all the same species, and yet they have slight variations between horns. Not dramatic, but slight. And you wouldn't give them their own species name based on a a crooked horn necessarily. So I think sometimes we kind of go a a little nuts over that. One other thing I want yeah, to ask. Yeah, and, and that's that's absolutely right. Well, one other thing I want to ask oh, you about ahead. Triceratops. I, now, I have always been under the impression that it was more rare than some of the other Ceratopsians. In that, other Ceratopsians like Pachyrhinosaurus and some of those other ones, they find these huge bone beds of considerable numbers. I was always under the impression that Triceratops appeared to be more of a loner, who you don't find those big those big assemblies assemblies of of animals together do you find triceratops in those larger groups as well well that's that's an interesting question uh and i've I've heard that same same line of thought for a while now uh where are the triceratops bone beds you've got all these beautiful specimens up up in canada these massive bone beds with dozens and dozens of skeletons um, where are all the Triceratops bone beds? Well, um, they're certainly um, more difficult to find, uh, but there are there have been bone beds found. Uh, over in eastern Wyoming, there's been several. Uh, there's one on a private ranch where they're, they're pulling out, oh, three, four, five specimens so far. Wow. Uh, the uh, There's another one on another private ranch in Montana where they've gotten at least six um, ranging from juvenile to um, adult, um, I believe the Naturalist Museum, uh, Naturalis Museum out of um, uh, Netherlands is is working on that site. Uh, so, so yeah, there 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 have been these these bone beds, um, and it could simply be that uh, has something to do with the, just the sedimentation and the and the rivers that were there. Uh, a lot of those big. Uh, Ceratopsian bone beds, there was probably a large herd of them crossing a river, and, and many of them didn't make it. Right. Uh, just, we see it with wildebeest and whatnot in Africa. Right. Um, it may be that the, the environment of the Hell Creek wasn't necessarily conducive to that. Right. Uh, or right. maybe it was easier to cross those rivers. They were a bit more shallow. Well, well that's true. Maybe they were better swimmers. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, no. better swimmers. There's, there's, a whole, there's a whole bunch of different hypotheses we can come up with. That's it. Yeah. Well, you know, when the guy behind you has horns sticking out and he tells you to move it, you move it. With with Packy with with Packy Rhinosaurus with that flat thing, I'm not in a rush, so, so I'll hang in the water longer. Yeah. Maybe that's what killed him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. So you've got you've got evidence of hadrosaurs. You have. Uh, ceratopsian. Now, is Triceratops the only Ceratopsian from that formation, or is he just the most prevalent? Well, see, and then there you go back to the whole lumpers versus splitters debate, uh, and and what what is the definition of species, and what's the definition of genera? I mean, right. uh, the traditional definition of species is is uh, you know two organisms or two individuals that can mate and produce viable offspring. Uh, whose offspring can then, of course, mate and produce viable offspring, right? Right. And, of course, there's genetic definitions now of species, but the traditional one is always based on reproduction. Well, we can't tell what di- who, which dinosaurs were dating who in, in the late Cretaceous. We can't tell that. Um, all we have are piles of, of bones and the shapes and the morphologies of the bones. We can't see who's dating who. Um, so... And, and as you pointed out earlier, there's at least there's three different kinds, three main types of variation that you can have, morphological variation uh, within species. Um, you have, uh, of course, uh, age, age variation, 
you know, uh, my bones are going to look a little bit different than yours. I heard you're 29. Is that right? It's 39, and it's been th- it's been 39 for 12 years, Walter. Come on. <laughs> I thought it was 29. I thought you said you were 29. No, that was too far of a stretch. (laughs) (laughs) Even I didn't, even I didn't believe 29. So come on. I've, I bumped it to 39 after, after numerous complaints. (laughs) No. (laughs) Well, anyway, of course you've got age variation. Uh, My, my bones are going to look a little different than my son's, even though we're sharing 99.999, whatever percent of our own genetics, uh, his bones are going to look a little different than mine because he's still growing in. Um, there's also sexual dimorphism, differences between males and females. So my bones are going to look a little different than my wife's, even though we're the same age because she's female, her bones and her structure of bones and some of the individual structures of, uh, on the bones are going to look different. Um, and then of course there's individual variation. I like to call that the, uh, the uh, Shaquille O'Neal versus Danny DeVito kind of <laughs> difference right there. You know, if right. you were a paleontologist and you saw the body of Shaquille O'Neal lying next to the body of Danny DeVito, dramatically different in morphology and, and, and shape and size, you might be inclined as a paleontologist to separate them out into two, two genus or species. Right. Right? Right. Um, so trying to, and this is something that a lot of my, my students have a hard time grasping, it's not simply a matter of black and white. Is this Taurosaurus or is this Triceratops? Is this Pachycephalosaurus? Is it Stigmola? It's it, where do you draw the morphological line? Uh, and for some paleontologists, uh, they, they keep that line very close uh, and try and lump everything into one species, genus. And for others, they like to name new dinosaurs. Right. You know, and they split them up into different. So, yeah. So, so we've mm-hmm. got ceratopsians, we've got hadrosaurs. Mm-hmm. You just mentioned pachycephalosaurs. What, what, who's running around in the, in the Hell Creek from that particular family? Uh, from, for pachycephalosaurs? Yeah. Oh, well, I'd say there's, there's probably one to four different types of pachycephalosaurs out there. Um, you know, in total, there's probably about 20, I have about 24 different, legitimate dinosaurs that are running around and having a good old time in the late Cretaceous. Wow. Um, other scientists have less than that. They've got around 14 to 15. Um, but based on the isolated bones that we are finding and the skeletons I've worked on and seen in the past, uh, from our sites as well as sites we've worked in the past, um, you, you know, it, it, I think 24 is a legitimate number right, right now. And I suspect we probably have a lot more that we haven't found. That's um, the exciting I believe part. it was. Yeah, I mean, there's been stu- some studies that suggest that there's about 71% of the, of the genera uh, out there. Wow. Uh, are not found yet, right. haven't been discovered yet. Um, so as far as Pachycephalosaurus, uh, at, at least you have Pachycephalosaurus wyomingensis. Um, then you might, you could make the, the argument that, uh, Draco Rex Hogwartsia is a legitimate dinosaur. The skull is dramatically different right. than, uh, Pachycephalosaurus. Uh, there's Stiggy Moloch, which is quite a, a little bit different. Um, and then there's, uh, there's another one out there, which, uh, Stegosaurus or Stereos, I can never pronounce it properly. Stereosolpholis. Right. <laughs> So I'm not sure if I buy them all being legitimate, but, but certainly uh, there's more than just one. Right. So, and so what about, yeah, the, then, what about the armored guys, the ankylosaurs? Are they, are they distinguishable enough to be able to say you have numerous species or is it just mainly ankylosaurus? Well, the problem with uh, the ankylosaurs is the same problem that that the um, that the pachycephalosaurs have. Uh, there's just not a whole lot of material. Right. Um, you know, you have probably 300 some triceratops skeletons. You have uh, hundreds of duckbill skeletons. You've got at least 60 T. Rex specimens now, or close to 60. Um, but then from there, there's a huge drop. Fessel source, you might have 25, 30 different skeletons. 
struthiomimus has a handful of good specimens. Packy, um, guess how many good Packy skulls are out there? I couldn't imagine. Good complete ones. Wow. I about five. Wow. There's only, there's only about five really good pachycephalosaurus skulls. And then that's counting, that's not counting isolated domes, which are a little bit more solid. I'm, I'm referring to the whole, or a good portion of the skull. Wow. Um, you know, and, and of course, uh, the first one, the one found in 1943, from which everything has been based, uh, that only had a skull. That was it. Uh, the, uh, the Sandy specimen, which is when I had it, it was found by Mike Trebold back in 1994. That was one of the most, uh, one of the most complete ones found in the Hell Creek. Uh, and that one was probably about 40% complete. Wow. Had a good skull and about 40% of the body. But for the others, I don't think, if I recall correctly, I don't think Draco Rex even has a body. It's a skull. Man. So, yeah. So a lot of the, a lot of the specimens that, um, or a lot of the um, the theories and the hypotheses that we have about these dinosaurs, in many ways, they're based on on very fragmentary remains. And so, uh, with all my students that come through our program, I, you know, I tell them, in science, you have to be skeptical. Whenever you see somebody on TV telling you that this animal, this dinosaur, did a certain behavior, it did this, it, it did that, and, and a lot of times they'll they'll present their arguments as if it's fact. Right. Um, you got to be a little skeptical of that. Every good scientist should be skeptical. And, and one of the first questions you should ask is how much material do they actually have? You know, if, if you are, you know, I, I failed calculus a few times, George, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, some basic statistics, right? If you're in, if your sample set equals one, you know, there's not a whole lot of your your hypothesis is is really built on some pretty shaky foundation. So, right. um, so anyway, so getting back to your original question about ankylosaurs, um, so hackies are are fairly rare, extraordinarily rare. Um, ankylosaurs, there's a few really good skeletons of ankylosaurus uh, magdaventris. Um, there are um, there are a couple specimens. Uh, that are decent of a notosaur, and uh, and of course, the difference between an ankylosaurus and a notosaurus is uh, the uh, the ankylosaurus has that armored club, uh, armor plating, and a club tail. Has a big bony club at the end of its tail. Uh, T. Rex knee knocker. Right. And uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the uh, the notosaurs basically have these shoulder spikes, these big, long, nasty looking shoulder spikes. Um, so they were definitely not huggers, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> well, but, when you, but there's, there's only been a handful of them found. So wow. they're rare. When you see rarities like that, um, packies and, and, and kylosaurs, is that to you an indication of maybe the environment didn't support a lot? So they were a rare animal or could it be an indication that, they may have lived in a little higher elevation where they're not as likely to be covered during maybe seasonal flooding. Is there any way to, to have, I mean, did you have any idea why you see limits in those particular animals? Well, that's a great question. And it, 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 a lot of it goes back to collection bias and preservational bias. Uh, those are two things that can really mess up an ecological evaluation of, a, of an e- ecological system uh, in paleontology because um, preservational bias is where, of course, just the bones just didn't preserve well. Uh, so and getting back to the raptors, raptors are very bird-like. Their bones are hollow. Uh, the outside edges of the bones are, are very eggshelly like um, and uh, – they, they fall apart very quickly when when uh, they're exposed to the elements. You know, getting that freeze thaw zone, uh, a raptor skeleton just falls apart to dust very quickly. Right. Um, so your smaller dinosaurs, like your Pachycephalosaurus, your Troodontids, your your Alvarezosaurids, your Dromaeosaurs, these are going to basically weather very quickly. And if you're not out there to find them fast, they're going to fall apart before anybody ever sees them. Okay, um, 
And this is going to lead you to a, a collection bias. Uh, people are more inclined to pick up or collect the big specimen that's sticking out of the wall. Right. So all, all of your big animals like Triceratops and Edmontosaurus and T-Rex, it's, it's, no, it's just simply logical that you're going to have more of those found. Um, so it's, it's hard to, to say, yeah, you know, ankylosaurs were, were just more of a rare sighting in the Hell Creek. Um, they were certainly big animals, and you would expect to see more of them in the fossil record, um, and you don't. Right. Um, I was working. I worked on one skeleton in 2011. It was coming off a private ranch in eastern Wyoming, and it was just it was a bizarre sight. We recovered about 350 scoots, the pieces of the armor, and one toe, and that's what it. The heck. And that was it. What would there was cause no, that? There was no leg bones. That's a brilliant question. I have no idea. You, uh, there's, you would think, you know, they, they had very large femurs. They had large humerus, pelvis. All that should have been there. It wasn't. And so there's some sort of taphonomic um, bias or preservational bias going on with, with, um, with ankylosaurs, and I don't understand what it is. Wow. And, it, and I was told that wasn't the first specimen like that. The, the South Dakota School of Mines and Tech worked on another one, I believe, in the 70s that was just like that. And I think they were chalking that, that up to some sort of uh, um, preservational bias, some, some, some sort of ch- taphonomic right. change. Uh, uh, the little armor plates Boy. were like uh, Frisbees, I believe they were referring to, and they, they just deposited in one area. Boy, but that, that wouldn't make any sense because if they are embedded in the skin, uh, I don't know, maybe they were so embedded that something like a Tyrannosaur preferred Ankylosaur on the half shell. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> maybe yeah. they ripped off the carapace and, and you walked off with your meal and you left that that ancient yep. half shell. Boy, what a, what an amazing, I'd never heard of that in my life. That's 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 more than likely about right, you know, because you know take 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 the leg bones off to go feed the little ones back at the nest, and then leave the skin leave the the skin with all the armor right there. Right. Um, you know who knows. God, how amazing is that though? Well, that's well mm-hmm. talking about predators. Let's get into the 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 uh, the predators that are cruising around the Hell Creek. Now, you had sure, mentioned a sure. large number of tyrannosaurs, which stuns me because everything I've always read has always been that it is such an incredibly rare dinosaur. And I guess maybe worldwide it, or, or North America wide, maybe it is rare, but you've got evidence of, of a lot of them, right? Well, with, with tyrannosaurs, of course, tyrannosaurus was, it was the pinnacle of, of, Theropod evolution. I mean, it was it was a beast. You're talking an animal 45 feet long, uh, probably six to seven tons. Had a six foot long skull with you know 50 big banana shaped daggers that were designed for breaking and crushing bone. Um, this thing probably had uh, one of the most powerful bite forces in the animal kingdom, going anywhere from some estimates go 8,000 pounds per square inch. Others are well above 14 to 20,000. So this was this was a monster, um, and they're they're big. They got big, right? They're forty five feet long. So, uh, from a preservation standpoint, we should find a lot of them, and we now have a pretty significant number. Um, in nineteen ninety, uh, prior to Sue the T Rex, the infamous Sue the T Rex, uh, there were only twelve known specimens. And the vast majority of those were less than 20% complete. Um, if I recall correctly, the best one was at the American Museum. That was about 45% complete, I think, with a nice skull. It was since this discovery of Sue, you know, and, and everybody, uh, for good or for bad, realized that there were some T-Rexes out there, and those T-Rexes were worth a lot of money. Right. Um, then everybody and their grandmother started looking for them. 
Now, again, good or bad, some of those folks really didn't know what the hell they were doing. Excuse my French. Right, but I understand. Um, right. But it was that, that competition, uh, it was that, uh, that drive to find more that caused more of those discoveries to be made. And so, so now we've gone from 13 specimens in 1990 to close to 60. Wow. Um, University of Kansas is working on one right now. They've got a, a decent specimen. Um, again, at the Natural, Naturalis Museum is working on one. Um, I know of another commercial gentleman who's working on one. Uh, so there's there's been quite a number of them found since that time, and, and many of these are, are rather complete. So right. We know an awful lot about T-Rex now and their anatomy uh, and a little bit about their variation. Of course, that's, that's a matter of debate, too. <laughs> right, right. As, as you've seen from all the Facebook arguments and posts oh, uh, over the last several decades. Oh, I, I get to the point where, I mean, in one aspect, yeah. it is great. But I, I'll tell you my opinion. Sometimes I think paleontology can be described as the science that tries to disprove the obvious. <laughs> I think, I think, I mean, I've heard, I've, I've heard people and, and I understand, and it's good for the science. Don't get me wrong. But you know, when you begin to say that an animal, the size and the way it's constructed, a Tyrannosaurus Rex would be this animal that if he tripped and fell, he died. Or if he ever laid down, he could never stand up or he couldn't chase anything. He couldn't move. He had bad eyesight. He couldn't hear. You read those things and you go, well, how the hell did this thing eat? Uh, Just how does does a bumblebee fly? Right, right. Exactly right. right. So I think I think sometimes these things are proposed not necessarily for the best interest of science, but to get attention. And I mean, when I. uh, Yeah. When I look at when I look at Tyrannosaurus Rex, my first reaction to the idea that it can only wa- wander mindlessly and hope it finds something dead, just the amount of energy it takes to feed the mass, that alone, to me, says this animal can't survive hoping to find enough dead right. stuff to keep him fed. Well, clearly Tyrannosaurus Rex is your apex predator, I guess, for there. But what about the little guys, the little raptors, the dromaeosaurs, those little guys? What What's going on with them? Well, well you know, I was just going to add one more thing to what you said. I agree with you 100% on T-Rex. Um, you know, they, they started saying, well, it's got the short arms, so it can't be a good predator. And if it, I remember one that one quote where if, uh, if it fell, it would possibly fall and break its neck, right? <laughs> it didn't have anything to support it. Okay, and, and my answer to that is how many ostriches running 45 miles an hour do you ever see trip? Right. Well, good no. point. Good, good point. Nature does not build, and, and I'm not saying that, that evolution works in a, always a progressive, you know, upward uh, advancing way, but nature does not build an organism that's destined to fail or its bones to collapse under its own weight. You know, we may not understand exactly how it did what it did, but we have plenty of evidence to show that it did hunt. It was an active predator. Um, good friend of mine, Robert Palma, he found a, 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 a fused tail vertebrae, um, two fused tail vertebrae with, with a T-Rex tooth sticking out of the side of it. Oh, God. The fuse was all scar tissue, right? So if the animal was scarring, if that was all scarred, was the animal alive or dead? Right, had, had to, to be, be alive. alive. Had to be alive, right. right? And it had to have escaped. It shows you. It shows you another thing that that sometimes T. Rex missed. Right. Um, but you know, and in this last debate now with with how fast T. Rex was, um, I, in all in all fairness, I haven't had a chance to read the whole paper, but um, I think twelve miles an hour is a bit on the slow side, and I, I, agree. I would best I would I would guess. Uh, and again, I need to go back and read the whole paper a couple times to see what their what their assumptions are and what uh, what their calculation is. But um, generally, when I hear those slow estimates, uh, usually it, it implies that their weight estimates are really big. Right. Um, instead of you know five to seven tons, they're in the nine to twelve 
category or something like that. Uh, but, but anyway, um, we'll see. Right. Uh, after field season, I have, I have a ton of research papers that I have to read when, when I get back. Yeah. <laughs> so then with, with, yeah, I got to some- yeah, that's well. That's the other thing. You know, that's something I forgot to mention. Yeah. You also make school visits, right? So, for anybody who's listening or watching, who is a teacher, we people can also hire you to come. I mean, you've been so incredibly educational for our listeners, and our listeners know a lot about dinosaurs. To to bring you in, they can bring you into a classroom, and you can sit down and talk to the entire school about what you do, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, it's one of the things we do in the winter time. Uh, you know, we we collect the, the 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 skeletons and the bones and the data, and we get all that data and we take it back to Florida in the uh, in the winter time. Right. Um. And uh, you know, other than sitting on a beach and sipping margaritas in January, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, down in, down in Florida, you know, we also. We also prep the bones. We clean them up. I do my research. I write when I whenever I can. Uh, and then we, of course we go into schools and do talks. Right. You know, so, so if you're in the, um, if you're, and, that's, that's, and you're in Florida, right. During the, you, during the winter months, right. Yeah. In the winter months we go down to Florida. Right. Yeah, I take, take the kids down the, the peace river and we go battling alligators and looking for megalodon teeth, which is always fun. You know, the first time I ever saw a wild alligator was in the peace river. The alligator was uh-huh. maybe probably 22 inches at the most but i saw it underwater <laughs> as far as i was concerned it it was a dinosuchus this thing was clearly 60 feet long <laughs> first thing i did first thing i did walter is released a yellow dye and then yes <laughs> after, after after my yellow dye pack went off which you know hid my escape i got out of that water and i've That's- never been back since so <laughs> You, you and your family can collect all you want, but I'm not ever going back there again. <laughs> well, I, there was just a, a handful of attacks there, too. A handful of game Man. attacks there in the Peace River just, just recently. I don't know if you heard oh. that or not, but... Well... Yeah. I, I, yeah I, the first time we went out there, I, I took the kids out there, and uh, we went to what's called the Arcadia Boat Ramp, and we jumped out there, and we started... You know, sifting and, you know, I did what the books tell you because it was the first time I was ever down in Florida fossil hunting. And I got my $5 fossil permit and I went out there and we had the sifters and, uh, doing our thing. We were out there for a couple hours and found a handful of teeth and whatnot. And I walked back to the parking lot and here comes this guy and he's wearing scuba gear and he comes up and, uh, and he's, he's carrying one of those floatable screens and, and uh, and I was carrying a floatable screen, so we both knew what we were doing. And uh, and he said, well, did you have any luck? Did you have any luck finding fossils? And I said, yeah, I did, and such and such. And then he said, oh, uh, did you see that 10-foot alligator? And I said, what 10-foot alligator? <laughs> <laughs> Where was the 10-foot alligator? <laughs> so, yeah, you got to be a little careful. In Whoa. But... But the, the, the neat thing about being in Florida and playing around in the Peace River is it's a lot like some of those rivers in the Hell Creek. Really? You know, where you're getting the, the concentrations of teeth and bones in those gravel lenses, uh, and, you know, and you're getting the, the, the channel fills and you're getting all where you're finding fossils. So, so it's, in many ways, it's from a taphonomic standpoint, I may be out there with kids playing and, and collecting shark teeth, but I'm also going, hmm, how's this geology work in here? Because it looks a lot like it could be similar to the Hell Creek. Wow, what a great way <clears throat> to better understand the Hell Creek than to see it in, before your eyes in, 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 in the state that it, it would have been or may have been back in the Cretaceous. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. And Hell Creek is, is, is wonderful for teaching as well as, uh, you know, for finding stuff. You know, whenever I pull one of those little, um, genuine South Dakota crocodile teeth, uh, you know, out of the Hell Creek wall. Right. And, uh, you know, I turn to the kids and I say, well, what do you think this is? So well, it's a tooth. Like, yep. It's a tooth. What kind of, what kind of fossil is it? Or what, what animal do you think it came from? And then when I tell them it's an alligator, they're like, Alligators lived that long ago. Yeah, they lived, they were the great uncles of dinosaurs, and and uh, and what do you think the climate was like back then? 
significantly warmer, right? Right. Alligators are living in warmer clients today. So it's a great way to transition into other sciences and, and so on and so forth. But anyway. Right. So uh, lastly, getting back to the raptors, because yeah. your, your point earlier about how difficult it is to find one in a good state of preservation because of how thin wall their bones are and how relatively small they are. What kind of raptors have come out that you've been able to identify? Well, you know, most raptors are known only from teeth. Um, and the Hell Creek, um, I, from the teeth, from the teeth alone, uh, there's at least four to five different species based on the different morphologies of the teeth. Um, so uh, right now, there are some folks who are just saying that there's only one type of raptor out there, and that's a carol raptor. Um, or they've suggested in the past that there was only one, I should say. Um, a carol raptor would have been a small, uh, very fast, as you would imagine from Jurassic Park movies, to jump very high, run pretty quick, um, probably feathered and probably social. But it was a reasonably small specimen. Uh, most likely. I say most likely because all of the referred material to a Cararaptor is just an isolated jaw. One dentary and one maxilla, I should say. Wow. So so that's it. That's all we've got that's a, certainly attributed to a Cararaptor. The whole name of Cararaptor is based on a jaw, a lower jaw and an upper jaw. That's it. Wow. Well, now, Speaking of raptors, even though this one may not have come from the Hell Creek, there is a raptor mm -hmm. who is not only a monster, but also very near and dear to you. What is that mm -hmm. raptor's name? Well, the, the big raptor that we find out there in the Hell Creek uh, was actually found by a good friend of mine, Robert De Palma. Um, and he and I have been friends for many, many years, and this one is Dakota Raptor. Um, Dakota Raptor was in Hell Creek. Uh, it was oh. probably a very minor component or a very rare component. Uh, there's only been one partial skeleton of Dakota Raptor that's been found, um, and uh, uh, it's only about 10% complete. Uh, but the, the, the nice thing and the reason why it's near and dear to me is because Robert was nice enough to name it after me. So. I have a, a raptor named after me, Dakota Raptor Steini. And so, How cool uh, is very, that? Very honored by that. That was awesome. And, and now I can definitely retire to, to Florida and sit on a beach and sip margaritas. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, but what a, gr what a great honor to bestow on somebody. And especially, it's forever. And on top mm. of that, it's such mm. a big raptor. It's such a cool looking thing. Um, man, congratulations. Oh, yeah. That's very exciting for you. And for anybody who's not had a chance to, to know Dakota Raptor, you can go online. You can look up Dakota Raptor Steini, which is a remarkable example of raptors that are certainly as big as the ones portrayed in the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World series. The only difference is this is an actual raptor, not a Hollywood made up raptor. This is a pretty massive animal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dakota Raptor would have been just an absolutely incredible dinosaur. You're talking an animal somewhere between 18 to 20 feet long. Uh, I had extremely long, long legs, powerful legs, but, but more gracile than a Utah Raptor. Um, it was fairly looked to be very quick based on the limb proportions. I would not be surprised if it couldn't run 30 miles an hour or more. Wow. Um, could easily probably jump twice its height. Um, it, um, had, uh, the claw on this alone, just the, the killing claw is, is just absolutely massive. I mean, it is oh, about six inches or so in length. Oh. And then, and then you, and when you realize that this, this is just a bony portion of that, that second digit claw, say the, the, uh, the ungual. In life, that would have a, a toenail over the top of that, a keratinaceous sheath over the top that would extend it almost another 40%. So uh, just a nasty, nasty animal. And then if, if, you, if you picture the Jurassic Park ones where they were probably social and pack-hunting animals, um, and if Dakota Raptor was like that, 
uh, it would certainly be a, a scary thing to see if you were living 65 million years ago and saw a pack of these Dakota raptors coming along. Um, now, this brings up another question. Uh, if we have Dakota raptor there in the Hell Creek, then you have to completely redo your food pyramid. <laughs> you know, the, the whole food web. Right. You know, you have Tyrannosaurus at the top, and and then you have Dakota raptor, a very significantly sized animal, competing with either young Tyrannosaurus and Nanotyrannus, or if you believe Nanotyrannus is just a baby T. Rex or a young T. Rex, then uh, you certainly have at least some competition going on there between um, a significantly large raptor um, with a, a mid-sized tyrannosaur um, all fighting for the, the, the food resources of the day, which, which would have either been primarily Edmontosaurus, uh, duckies, most duckies was probably, ducky, duck-billed dinosaurs was probably the, uh, uh, the, the most significant prey source of tyrannosaurs. Right. Um, and uh, things like uh, Thessalosaurus is another dinosaur that would be living about that time. Another one without any armor or, or spikes or anything like that. So anyway, you have to re reevaluate how how that hierarchy of predators and prey were interacting. Um, now that we know there's a, a big raptor out there. Man, what a horrifying animal! You know, you, you look at Tyrannosaurus rex, and you you always go, "Yes, this thing would have been terrifying to see." But in my opinion, it's the mid to smaller size carnivores that I think would have been more horrific mm -hmm. to come in contact with than something as big as a Tyrannosaurus Rex. I actually think, you know, time time travel is invented. I think you stand at least a chance <laughs> of getting away from a Tyrannosaurus Rex, but something like a Dakota yeah. Raptor, I, I don't know what you do. I don't know what you could do. Well, you know, I, I think if you had the ability to, to, to climb into a cooler or shut the door, I don't think they could open doors like you see in Jurassic Park. Right. <laughs> so, right. You know, that whole bit, I don't, I don't know if that's uh, possible. <laughs> you know, and they were certainly intelligent animals, but. Right, you know, right. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, they would be a very scary sight. Absolutely. An incredibly scary sight, and I agree with you. I would not want to meet, meet up with a pack of raptors. <laughs> I, I would much rather deal with a rex Right. Well, here's the last thing, because I know it's your only day off, and I know you're crazy busy, so I'd like to ask you this. I've read sure. so many proposals that say that dinosaurs appeared to be dying out long before the impact of the asteroid down in the Yucatan, and that... Had it not hit, they ultimately would have still suffered the exact same result. So with your study and your research in the Hell Creek, does the Hell Creek support that idea or do you see something different? Oh, you know, that reminds me of the uh, the quote from a few years ago about, uh, yeah, asteroid killed off the dinosaurs, the last two of them. Right, right. right. Uh, I, that, that's not what I see at all. Um, from what we're, we're we're seeing in the just from the isolated bones. Now there there's some data you can you can't get off of an isolated bone. Okay, but um, there's also a good deal that you can. Uh, and based on the isolated remains, many of which don't seem to fit with any of the known, established, well established, well documented genera. Um, I, I would argue that the faunal diversity was doing just fine at the end of the Cretaceous period. They were, they were doing very well. Um, like I said, uh, based on other people's numbers and the ones that I agree with, we're, we're looking at some 24 different types of, spe of dinosaur that were living out there in Hell Creek times. Um, you know, you have two to four ceratopsians possibly you've got a, one that at least two i think two tyrannosaurs myself uh four to five different types of raptors two to three different troodontids you have anzu which is another amazing new addition that was that was added it was found in 1999 that was one, that was my baby for many many years eventually went to the carnegie and they finally published on that in 2014 um anzu is an amazing 
teeny massive oviraptor, very cool, cool dinosaur, very cassowary like. Uh, but you not only have Anzu, but there's also rumors of another uh, oviraptorid that's out there, uh, a smaller one, a little bit different. Um, you have troodontids. Um, a few weeks ago, um, I was digging on this one site and found a hand claw, and it was a very weird looking hand claw. Um, it didn't fit some of the stuff that I was used to seeing. So I put some pictures on Facebook and a couple good friends of mine said, you know what? I think that's an Alvarez assorted. So here's another dinosaur that's, we only know from isolated bits and pieces. Um, but it was probably a component of the Hell Creek ecosystem. Um, again, with the whole, we talked about the pet debate between the pachycephalosaurs and, uh, the ankylosaurs and all that. So, there's a lot of dinosaurs running around out there, and really the one, if if I had to, if I had to follow that that line of thinking where they were dying out slowly, uh, there is one lineage of animal out there that does appear to be speciating less, and those are hadrosaurs. Wow! Uh, in the campaign, we find lots of hadrosaurs, and there's lots of different morphological variations. Parasaurolophus and Corythiosaurus and uh, uh, Brachylophosaurus and so on and so forth. A whole bunch of different ones in the, in the Judith River and the Two Medicine. And then you come to the Hell Creek and you have Edmontosaurus, and that's it. Your basic plain Jane hadrosaur, your basic ducky. No crests, no armor, no way to defend itself other than the herd. Um, so Edmontosaurus appears to be the only hadrosaur out there there has been rumors of a, a couple of specimens that might be Parasaurolophus in the Hell Creek. I, I have my doubts about that. There was one called a Natto Titan uh, that uh, was a very extremely large duck bill. Uh, it was found many, many, many years ago over by Ecolaca, Montana. That one probably is just an adult, uh, an older version of Edmontosaurus. So, if, if there was any line of dinosaurs that seemed to be speciating less, it would be the hadrosaurs. Um, and I can only just to throw out a hypo hypothetical hypothesis. Um, is uh, The best guess is that tyrannosaurs are hitting their peak of predation and hadrosaurs are going down. And so it could simply be that tyrannosaurs were, were really decimating their numbers. Right. Uh, and causing the, the hadrosaur line, at least in North America, uh, I'm not sure about Asia and all the other places, but at least in North America, the hadrosaurs are declining. It could be due to the tyrannosaurs. Wow. That's one possible idea. Right. Now, does that mean that dinosaurs as a whole large group were going extinct? No, not at all. Because dinosaurs have had those natural extinction, natural fluctuations. Um, for 160 million years. You know, they were the dominant life form on the a terrestrial life form on the planet. Right. Um, for over 160 million years, and they stayed. They had various changes in their climate and changes in their um, migration routes and land masses and all that stuff. They've had examples where predators and predator and prey, one would go extinct and so on and so forth. But they didn't go extinct. It took a very, very, very bad weekend in, in geological terms <laughs> to wipe them out. And, um, you know, it's uh, the more and more we look at the Lake Cretaceous and we study the KT boundary, the more we realize just how nasty that weekend would have been. Um, you know, the prevailing hypothesis now, uh, the Alvarez and, and, and Jan Schmidt and all those folks, um, the asteroid impact theory um, just keeps gaining more and more credibility every year, more and more data. Right. Um, so, wow. yeah, I, I, I'm a big, big proponent of the, the reasonably quick extinction of the dinosaurs, uh, at least in geologic terms. So that's, and most likely from an asteroid. Right. That is so cool. Well, listen, everybody, if you want the opportunity of a lifetime, go to paleoadventures.com. I'll put a link on, on my podcast page and, and research what Walter Stein is doing, what he's done, what he can do for you. And this December, 
uh, ask your parents, or if you are an adult, give yourself the greatest Christmas gift you could ever want. See if you can go with him to go out in the field. One of my things on my bucket list is to come out there, Walter, with you one of these days, if nothing else, just to spend an afternoon and watch what you guys are doing. Uh, Cause I'd love to do that. Oh, absolutely. I'd love to do that. Uh, if, if so, we would, we would love to have you come up. Well, we'd love to have you come up. Absolutely. It, it would be a blast. Anytime you want to just give me a call. Nice. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your crazy schedule and to, for giving us such an in-depth look at the Hell Creek Formation and the dinosaurs in general. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough, Walter. I really appreciate you doing that. Oh, you're, you're very, very welcome. I was, it was fun, fun uh, chatting with you. And uh, I guess tomorrow I'm going to go climb a mountain and hang off a cliff and work on a new potential Struthiomimus site that we found uh, just end of last year. So <sighs> I'm... Looking for that, and hopefully you'll out and help me find a few more next year, next summer. And and tomorrow I'm doing laundry. So hey, thanks, <laughs> thanks for thanks for sharing your life with mine. Uh, that was really kind of you to end the the interview that way. That's really kind of you, <laughs> Walter. Thanks so much, George, man. Gonna... All right, great talking to you, man. Take care. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. All right, bye bye. See you. All right, how'd you guys like that uh, that interview? Wasn't that cool? Really a lot of great information in there. Really exciting stuff. So if you've ever wanted to go dig dinosaurs, you need to make sure and, uh, and go to uh, Walter Stein's page, which is paleoadventures.com. Uh, I know you would enjoy it immensely. Thank you guys so much for taking the time out to write to me and to send me the questions you had. And I hope that you all enjoyed this show. I'm going to be leaving for Canada tomorrow, and so I'll be gone for five days. But when I get back, I'll also produce a few more of these, and I'll also do more with uh, uh, with your Ask Dinosaur George questions so I can get a lot more of your questions answered. For everybody out there, I hope you guys follow me on Facebook and Twitter. If you're following me at home on YouTube or if you're listening on YouTube, I hope you guys will like the uh, like the videos and and leave your comments and please share them with your friends. Anybody who is like minded like yourself, that is kind and courteous and loves the outdoors. This is the channel for you. For everybody there uh, out there, I hope you have a great week and a great month and a great year and all the other things that come with it. Uh, visit my website at dinosaurgeorge.com or go to my catalog store.dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, everybody, thank you so much. Have a great day, and I will talk to you all soon. Thank you for listening to The Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, keep digging for clues about the past.